So hello and welcome to this latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions. And today I'm joined all the way from Aberdeen <laughs> by Jason, uh, <laughs> a regular, a regular host of the show, um, who's taking the time to share with us a digitally reimagined learning and teaching and assessment future. So uh, without further ado, tell us more, Jason. And thank you very much, Kenji. And uh, hello to everyone. Um, I'm not sure at what point in my life I would have foreseen the ability to sit in a car somewhere uh, just outside Aberdeen and by a combination of a mobile phone being used as a hotspot, an iPad propped up on a steering wheel with a Werther's original suite being used to level it up um, and, uh, and deliver to um, anyone in the world, in fact, and um, no idea where the audience may be spread amongst uh, today um, in the, the place of technology. And one of the things that it has uh, led to is a reimagining of what education can be delivering. Um, at the moment, uh, JISC and myself is very much involved with the Scottish Funding Council's review that's ongoing of the coherent provision and sustainability of Scottish further and higher education. And as part of that, we've been considering well, what education might look like. The good news is today, this won't all be me talking. Um, I'm going to be asking for your ideas about reimagining what learning, teaching and assessment might look like. We did some initial work um, in consultation with many in the sector uh, to look at what sort of things um, might come out of this in, in terms of reimagining learning, teaching and assessment. And there's three particular themes that we, we landed upon, and that's going to be the structure for today. So after this introductory bit, uh, we'll be going on to, first of all, consider the question of inclusive learning and what that might mean and how digital can enhance our ability to deliver inclusive learning. Secondly, we'll go on to look at personalised and adaptive learning. Uh, again, the extent to which digital can take that forward. And thirdly, we will come to the area of authentic assessment. We know how bound up um, assessment is with teaching and learning. And so we'll give that some particular thought as well. I'm going to be looking for you to come in and, uh, with the, and Kenji with his, uh, his wonderful hosting skills will no doubt uh, uh, chair the session, but, uh, uh, but bringing your ideas as well after I give a bit of introduction to each of those areas. So are you sitting comfortably, ideally not in a car in the middle of Aberdeenshire, but somewhere uh, with a little bit better <laughs> connectivity uh, perhaps, and hopefully this is all going well. Um, and um, yes, and uh, hopefully hear from your ideas. Um, there are some things we recognise that have been around in education for quite a long time, um, and uh, I did spend quite a while, uh, I have spent quite a while um, engaged in the educational world. I find it very difficult to move away from blocks of one hour. That's, um, it's somehow ingrained in my psyche that things will happen in blocks of one hour. I have made the joke before that uh, when I've been invited to talk for 20 minutes, as a lecturer and lawyer by my backgrounds, um, as a lecturer, I'm predisposed to talk for an hour even if I'm told to talk for 20 minutes and as a lawyer I'm predisposed to charge for an hour even if uh, it's only 20 minutes um, but uh, but today I'm coming for free you'll be glad to hear um, and, and uh, yeah and, and there's that um, I also recall being uh, shown around a new college building a few years ago quite a few years ago now but not that long ago this building had cost many millions of pounds and being shown around there was a lot of glass and concrete and it was all primary colours and very clean and neat and tidy and quite an enticing space. But I happened to uh, ask or felt uh, the need to ask um, that I was seeing an awful lot of um, box-like rooms uh, with 25, 30 seats all facing towards a board, a smart board, but a, a board nonetheless. And, and I did ask um, whether there had been any thoughts about different ways of delivering the curriculum and getting people into 25, 30 person rooms all facing the front. And the answer that was given at that point was that the demographic of staff that this institution had for that campus was ageing and they felt that they weren't going to be uh, able to change the ways in which they delivered particularly. And I was struck, as I'm sure you will be, by the fact that, they, they, well, that may be a certain reality of the situation, um, but it wasn't exactly a learner-centric approach being taken uh, with that. So um, the, the question that comes about then is, can we um, imagine different ways of doing things from now? If we were starting 
to design post-16 education in Scotland from scratch. How would we design it? And there are going to be some things that um, we, we live with the legacy of what we've got. It's all very well if you've got a, an old building and uh, and it'd be lovely if you've got the capital funds perhaps to uh, entirely change that. That's not always going to be realistic. But there are other areas where we can look again at what we're doing and at least be clear as to the rationale, if not uh, looking at the ways in which it can change. Okay, so it's uh, Friday morning and it's time to be radical then. And uh, I'll be looking for your radicality or radicalness or whatever it is. So first of all, turning to inclusive learning, it's something that um, I'm very passionate about. Um, and uh, again, we all already in Scotland and further in higher education have a keen eye on widening participation. I, I think we still all know that there are people who cannot access the current models of delivery of post-16 education. Um, the, we've moved in the direction of allowing more granular access, perhaps, um, but still, I think um, by the, the, the setup of the system, uh, in some ways by the funding available, and perhaps by culture, uh, we still have a focus on what we call full-time education, or at least very large chunk part-time education. And whilst micro-credentialing and short courses uh, have um, come about in a, a greater way, then perhaps that's an area for, for greater thoughts as to how we enable access. Well, so what can technology do in all of this? Well, first of all, um, there's accessibility by design um, at the beginning. Um, we've obviously had a change in regulations and imposition indeed, of regulations to take forward the, the accessibility inclusion aspects of stuff that's delivered online. Um, we can make, perhaps see a future where things are made easier. Does anyone remember WAP? W-A-P, Kenji will remember WAP, don't you? No. As in, as, as, as in connectivity, WAP, uh, web no, no. access protocols? Protocol. No, 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 the one be well before that. Once upon a time, um, there was an alternative to um, internet delivery that allowed the creation of many pages uh, that would uh, present on a mobile phone. So as well as setting up your website as normal, uh, you could set up WAP pages to display on early mobile phones that were internet enabled. So in order to do that, in order to enable access, you had to write an entirely new different set of pages. And guess what? It didn't take off, funnily enough. In fact, the smartphone changed to be able to access in better ways and with responsiveness um, uh, the normal internet. And I think we have to um, have to uh, learn from that sort of um, change. And um, and I, I, maybe we're not far off the day when, for example, in terms of images, whenever I include an image in a learning material, and um, then AI is be able to suggest an accessibility compliant description of that image to me, I will have to tweak it because only I will know what is the most relevant aspects of the image. Um, but to start me off then, that's not a bad point. And we already have got the, the, the digital enabling of, for example, subtitles, closed captioning in this uh, session, if you like, you could switch that on. Um, of course, there are limits to that. And in fact, you can imagine in terms of captioning, how well JISC is represented each time. JISC is not something that uh, the, the, um, the uh, captioning deals with particularly well. Um, and indeed, one, and I'm hoping for that day, of course, in terms of technology, whereby um, the AI knows, uh, it can have my LinkedIn profile, it knows that I work for JISC, and so it knows to look out for the word JISC, it recognises it and then includes it whenever I talk, uh, rather than coming out as JUST or JISP or God knows what else. Um, so um, further on inclusive learning, uh, for, from uh, we're looking at then, secondly, uh, something that's responsive to different needs, the needs of the learner, and, uh, and moving towards perhaps a, a new delivery point of view. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's got to be easier for, for, in terms of delivery. Uh, one of the barriers to more inclusive learning is the onus it places on the deliverer, the instructor, the tutor, the lecturer, in order to adapt. And as I said about WAP and uh, in presenting pages on mobile phones, 
And um, the more we can include it by design, the better. And the more that technology perhaps can do in the background to make life easier for the lecturer with good intentions, who wants to be more inclusive, to do so without placing a huge burden on them or an increased burden so much the better. At that point, I'm going to pause because I've done quite a lot of talking and let you do some talking. Um, uh, I'd like to hear any ideas you have for how technology, um, either present technology that's maybe not being used as much as it could be, or foreseeable future technology uh, that might increase our game in Scottish post-16 <laughs> education uh, with regards to inclusive education, inclusive learning. What's your ideas then? One, one notion that I've had listening to particularly the success over the lockdown period of support services, connecting one-to-one -one with people, the, the idea of moving online, making themselves available just for drop-in chats in the same way that when you're shopping for things, you always get that little bubble that says, chat with me. That, that seems like a really nice service. And I wonder if that could be appended to regular delivery in the sense of those students who are joining a, a college or a university for the first time and find that initial period, the first few months difficult, maybe least struggling to catch up, coming coming with minimum sort of um, entrance requirements, having just passed into the course, having an extra level of support offered by that one-to-one -one model, that drop-in session, reaching out to available tutors, that, that seems like something with potential, I would have thought, going forward. I think my observation would be very similar um, where we refer students to inclusive learning. I find that they're absolutely brimming over with ideas on how the students can. I mean, all the tools are there. There's no shortage of tools for students to access. Um, but there is still a stigma for the students in being referred to inclusive learning. So it feels like that support needs to be moved from special to mainstream so that all the students are, are um, accessing that support because um, so many students are disadvantaged when it comes to, to using, they're, they're, they're sitting, as you know, on tiny little phones trying to write essays and things like that. So um, I, I think we're going to need to do an awful lot more in terms of um, academic study support. <laughs> And I think that's an absolutely vital point about mainstreaming all this support. And I'm a big user on um, Microsoft Office of the read aloud feature. Uh, I, do, I do quite a lot of traveling. I certainly did do before the pandemic more, even more so. And the ability to have documents read out to me as I sat on a train or, or wherever it may be was, was uh, fantastic for me. And, and despite having no needs other than be, in being in a particular situation. And I think that, um, and a, a captioning would be another example captioning once upon a time required specialist software um they perhaps needed some training in how to use it and now it's a case of you know a lot of video conference packages and many other uh, delivery devices as well just clicking a button and there it is and for someone who often has because they're traveling Love about one. is um then uh, the ability to uh, actually just have the subtitles and not have the sound on is big for me any further ideas as to how we can progress inclusive education, inclusive learning? There was a, a link that I put into the chat referring to um, a standard that is being, well, well it started in, in the States, the universal design for learning. So talking around this idea from the start, we, we design for all from, from the beginning, every aspect of a course. And it's not specifically just talking about those with specific accessibility needs, but it is just a reimagining of, of the course and how it might work. But it's, I suppose the struggle with that is how, how do you start from the beginning again? How do you, given the wealth of experience and we're used to delivering the way that we are, it's not so much that there's a lack of ideas and things that we could try out. It's just, how do we start that? Um, and I'd, I'd be intrigued if anyone has, or if you know of a good example of how that's worked. I could come in, but I'll let anyone else who wants to. Uh, well, I'll go back to my point about, I think um, it's uh, first of all about making it as easy as possible 
Um, as you say, I have yet to met, meet the person who's uh, against inclusiveness, but uh, as has been pointed out, it's about how to embed it and how to make it as easy to access as possible. And so um, that's a pretty key. I think there is also a part, a change of culture that's required, and that is about um, even further learner centricity um, and uh, in considering what the learner needs. Um, there is no point in delivering by um, in a way that we have done previously if it's no longer relevant and no longer works for all the learners we want to reach. Um, and I think that point needs to be made. So it's perhaps around uh, prioritisation of inclusiveness um, and when we look at it. And actually, I think uh, the universal um, uh, uh, design for learning is very useful. And actually, it goes back to wider design principles. And uh, I'm no expert on design, but I have a, an amateur interest. And I was very much taken by a book called Universal Principles of Design that Marie many years ago and ever since then I have studiously noted every time I walk up to a door which has got a handle uh, but it wants me to push it and it's amazing in life how many times you'll come across handles where uh, you feel silly because you try and pull on a door and then realize it's got a handle on it because it's inviting you to pull it but in fact you have to push it um, I, ho I hope in education we don't have so many examples of that, but there are probably examples, and uh, maybe not quite to that extent, but absolutely design is a key part in it all. Okay, there's a lot we could do on that, but I'm going to move on and uh, with time in mind, personalised and adaptive learning then. Um, and that was, we're looking at responsiveness to the unique needs of the learner in which case. And perhaps it could be uh, suggested that an awful lot of our learning offer up until now has looked at students uh, joining a, a course of study, whatever it may be, and being assumed to have a fairly homogenous set of skills and knowledge already. Um, and we do um, offer different ways uh, in which we uh, we counter the fact that that's clearly really going to be the case. Um, uh, but uh, still, um, I wonder, uh, one of the questions is whether we can use technology in order to give a more personalised and adaptive experience. Of course, the main way in which we offer a personalised and adaptive experience uh, up until now and into the future will be the human element. Now, people are fantastic at personalised and adaptive response. That's what we do. Machines, maybe not so much. Um, but the questions are you know, whether we can use analytics, artificial intelligence, um, and then responsive uh, mechanisms in order to provide students uh, with, um, with things that are tailored for them. And we have examples of this. We know that, um, for example, um, students uh, entering a course are sometimes, if not more, uh, and frequently, more frequent in, and growing in frequency, uh, the number of times that they're assessed in the particular skill areas and offer a, offered an opportunity to have more training in a particular area. Uh, do you see uh, the, the future is involving a more personalised learning experience? And is there a place for technology in that? Ken, you'll I, have a view on this. I, I, I do. I mean, I, I like I like the notion of personalization, but it's 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 difficult. As as a teacher, um, I, I want my instinct is to bring the class along as a group at the same pace. It's to I, I have a schedule of lessons that and, and content that I need to deliver, and I have a schedule that I need to keep to and a very fixed assessment regime. So a, a lot of that infrastructure. So it denies me the ability to really personalize in, in, in the way it's envisioned in the literature. So what, what I'm interested in is how, how, how much can you personalize? I wonder if, if the, the phrasing is oversold. We, should, we could personalize to an extent a lot better than we do just now. Um, and with technology, the parts that I've seen that are really interesting is some of the things that Aftab at Bolton does with his nudge theory. So for every person, if you can track how they're doing and use some kind of automated or AI routine just to nudge people in the right direction, because sometimes that's all I need to keep motivated. So a, a message that pops up on your screen and say, look, you need to um, just, if you score 17% in the next sort of <laughs> lesson, then you'll, you'll manage the next grade level up or 17% is a bit low. <clears throat> but just some kind of technology that just taps me on the shoulder. And to be honest, 
having technology do it is sometimes less intimidating than having a person do it. Because I know that if a teacher in the past had told me, look, I, I see you're struggling a bit. <laughs> do you need a bit of help? Here's some extra work. It actually, that makes me feel bad because it means that someone has seen that I'm struggling and a lot of that comes with that. Whereas if a computer, <laughs> just a, a nameless nothing, tells me that I need some help or gives me a nudge or reminds me, that for, for me, that's that's less intimidating. I'm, I'm happier with that because it's kind of just like me and the machine. <laughs> so nudge, nudge is where it's at for me at the moment. I, I really like that concept. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I think that is, is uh, it brings up a number of things. Certainly one of the barriers um, to personalized and adaptive learning is the social nature of learning. And one thing that we do get from having a cohort of learners together doing the same thing is the ability for them to um, support each other and also to feel as part of a group. Um, if we went to the extreme of personalization, of course, uh, then it would mean each person doing their own thing and you would lose the social element. And secondly, I think you alluded to that practical part as well of organization. Nonetheless, I think in some of my online learning that I do, um, I occasionally get the message up saying you're clearly good at this do you want to just skip on to the next session um, and then often i get a bit that says um would you like to go through that section again <laughs> and um, as you say kenji and sometimes getting that from a, a, a system rather than from a person is uh, is more comfortable for some learners um, and it goes back to one of the the experiences that got me very much into this where i set up self-assessment questions for a large cohort of students that i was teaching and they went off and did computer-based um, online self-assessment questions and uh, they uh, strived to get 100% uh, doing these questions. And so effectively they were self-evaluating and what, and um, interestingly, I think if, um, I, if I'd invited them to know everything that was included in the questions, then they probably wouldn't have been so interested in trying to get 100% through reading books. But the fact that it was delivered uh, effectively and efficiently using a self-assessment uh, online test allowed them to uh, strive to, to know all the knowledge uh, that would happen. And again, you may, I don't think any of you have heard it before, but uh, I, they did the test first and typically most students got about 60, 70 percent and then went back to do it again to get 100 percent and found that the it was a bank of questions in fact that was coming from so they got a different set the second time and um yeah there, there was something about the gaming addictive quality that kicked in um uh, about that um I'm, I'm mindful of time i'm going to go on to authentic assessment which could be a whole um, virtual bridge in itself of course um, and I wonder whether technology can offer us the chance to be more accessible and uh, more continuous more secure and more authentic in the ways in which we offer assessment. And thank you for joining so far, Jane. Uh, Jane, I'm sorry. Um, the, um, and, and perhaps here in the consultations that I've been involved with so far, and um, there has been a bit of a difference between further and higher education, I have to say, perhaps because of the nature uh, of the different sectors involved. But still, I think there's are questions around. Um, and here we're talking both about formative and summative assessment and how we deliver it and what it means for the, um, uh, the, the learner. Uh, some interesting debate has been around uh, the nature of continuous or continual assessment, uh, where um, the evidence gathering is if, uh, almost automatic. So as I learn, something or someone indeed is uh, assessing me to know where I reach a level of competence. And um, in, in, in a, a, another world, perhaps, or indeed some of the worlds that we have at the moment, um, then there isn't a time pressure. It's whenever Jason gets to a particular level of competence, there will be a tick. There is no assessment event. Um, it's my learning, uh, ongoing learning that's assessed. And we do know that for some learners that that certainly takes away the, well, they, often the huge exam stress, for example, being placed in a gym hall um, and a, a desk in a very unfamiliar surrounding and being forced to do difficult things. Um, um, but then again, other learners do actually respond well to the learning event. And as someone who has perhaps been a uh, 
a crammer at certain points in his life, then uh, I have certainly had a certain um, uh, yeah, trigger of, uh, of the assessment to help me uh, boost my learning at certain points, let's put it that way. Um, I, I'm also minded of uh, the uh, further downside of uh, automation in that um, I remember many years ago, my uh, younger brother doing the European computer driving license, if you remember that. And he did so. He was very much uh, into tech in technology and he knew his way around. He went into the college to set his ECDL uh, assessment and he basically hacked the back end and just gave himself 100%. Um, which, uh, again, shows a certain technical skill, indeed. It also showed a certain um, cybersecurity aspect uh, to it all. Um, but, um, but, yeah, perhaps um, the, a danger of automation. Um, would you have any views as to uh, what technology might do in future? And, and we've seen on virtual bridges some very good examples, uh, particularly in gathering evidence, whether that's uh, uh, TikTok videos as a quick way to capture um, makeup work being done by students studying beauty at a college, uh, or indeed um, certain aspects of um, in, in virtual uh, or augmented reality environments in the construction industry. Any views on how technology might take uh, 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 assessment and authentic assessment forward? Um, for, for me, uh, assessment is interesting, and I like the idea of continuous assessment. So in, in the Japanese educational system, um, there, there is no final exam, really. Uh, in school, it, it was just a continuous series of short tests every week you know, on the subjects that you did. And students appreciated that. And later, when I came back as a teacher and taught in Japan, I, I was <laughs> students desired regular tests not not so much from the sense of continuous assessment and it's easier than a bigger exam they just wanted to know how they were doing and and they were a bit fixated with the idea of um am, am I progressing in the right way also how am I doing compared to everyone else in the room <laughs> um but they really appreciated the idea of of some formal arrangement that they knew how they were doing uh, and, and I think that additional information, which is perhaps the basis of formative assessment, but because it was conducted under a, a kind of summative context, it, it was the best of both worlds, I feel. So that, that idea is good. But at the same time, I, I like the idea of creating some formal, more rigorous test where I put somebody in a room and put them under the spotlight and say, see what you can do in, in this hour. Tell, tell, show me what you can come up with. Um, I'll give you a problem. I'll give you a task based on everything that you've learned up till now. Put that all together and show me something. Um, and I, I know that comes through in project work through HN Next Generation work that the SQA is working on. So there are different ways to tackle that. But I, I still, I like the idea of a hybrid, some form of continual assessment over a period of, of your course of study but also some, some key points where you're just asked to bring everything together because that continuous assessment focuses on a small part of your course. And I still want that kind of idea, did you take everything in? Can you bring it all to bear when, the, when you need to? So yes, uh -huh. that's... That's and that may be more important for some than others. And one example that was given, which I thought was an interesting one, was a university um, in a particular curriculum area saying that, uh, in fact, the traditional exam was in its way authentic um, because the students were going on to an eight hour professional exam, uh, which was held in very traditional circumstances. And the next step of their journey to a profession was the eight hour gym hall cold dusty under pressure exam and they had to be prepared for that and that point was taken yeah I think one of the questions though coming back to your engine there is about you talked about students and them and they and whether all of the students are of the same mind uh, in that and perhaps there's a cultural aspect that does lead to um, everyone being of that mindset but of course, is that the best culture uh, is then the question. Then, uh, again, open debate we could be uh, talking about for another hour, certainly. I, I, I agree. I, I, I enjoyed it in, in Japan, although it was very alien to me, having been brought up in a, in a UK educational system. Uh, I, I didn't understand their fascination with tests, but I did appreciate it. Now, un un unfortunately, um, that's bringing us to, to the end of this virtual bridge session. This is almost all that we have time for. Um, 
un, un, unless we can we can bring in we have time for perhaps just one more question jamie i see you're typing something into the chat do we want to unmute and uh, ask a final question to take us over the line um yeah um obviously the the kind of the, the assessment is um one aspect but also your portfolio and evidence is, is something i'm passionate about via the mechanism of mahara um, and it's um, it's often seen that it's a, a, a desirable rather than an essential part. Um, but when a lot of courses are evidence based, and and it's um, it's interesting to know whether that's taken off more during the pandemic, with um, the need to evidence learning rather than um, assess that learning, and it's where that balance should really sit. Very good point, and uh, yes, uh, I think that's. Something that's raised itself as an issue, the, the evidencing of assessment rather uh, of learning rather than the assessing of it. Um, though I, to my sight, I haven't seen much uh, movement on that. I think that's something that's going to come out as we move forward in the next years and reflect on the uh, challenges that we've had over the, the pandemic. And, and I think also possibly a future topic for a future virtual grid session. But unfortunately, that's all we have time for uh, in this YouTube recorded part of our virtual grid sessions. But certainly you do have time to join us for a live session here in the room. Um, please do. But until then, stay safe.